Welcome, and thanks for tuning in to this video series where I'll be dissecting and analyzing the writing styles of exceptional authors so that we all might discover together the countless literary techniques that make up exemplary prose. While I've discussed a number of important topics on my channel, tips and advice can only take a writer so far, and I want to impress upon you that there is no one correct way to write, or a single style you should strive to conform to. On the contrary. While most writers agree on certain elements of the craft, every author develops his or her own unique voice and learns to bend these rules when it suits them. The truth is, your story is real to the extent that you make it real, and there's no clear-cut way to go about it. All I can really do is come at it from as many angles as I can, which is why, throughout this series, I plan to make four videos for each author, providing an in-depth analysis of the techniques they use to write descriptions, action, dialogue, and introspection and exposition, these being the primary building blocks of narrative prose. And I could think of no author more deserving of being the first subject of this video series than Herman Wouk, a historical fiction writer who has a fair claim to stand among the greatest American war novelists. My dad had been insisting that I read Herman Wouk's The Winds of War for a while now, so I picked it up, and boy, was I glad I did. He is a master of his craft, so let me be clear, this is not a review or a critique of his work, merely an analysis of his writing style performed for the sake of understanding his literary techniques. And fear not, there will be no spoilers for The Winds of War in this video, just a variety of excerpts borrowed from the story which, on their own, don't really give away much, if anything. So, let's examine the techniques Herman Wouk implements when writing descriptions, specifically those of characters and settings. I'll start with the characters. Let's take a look at how he describes the character Victor Henry. Dark straight hair hung down his forehead. At 49, he had almost no gray hairs, and his charcoal slacks, brown sports jacket, and red bow tie were clothes for a younger man. It was his small vanity, when not in uniform, to dress youthfully. An athletic body helped him carry it off. Rhoda saw in the lines around his greenish-brown eyes that he was tired and deeply worried. Possibly from long years of peering out to sea, Henry's eyes were permanently marked with what looked like laugh lines. Strangers mistook him for a genial man. On display here is a crucial literary technique, mixing what I call surface description, or description of things that are uninteresting on their own, like hair and eye color, with an insight into the character. He mentions Victor Henry's hair and clothes, and immediately follows it up with a little insight into how it was his small vanity when not in uniform to dress youthfully. Wook then mentions his eyes, and again immediately follows it up with an insight into how the lines around them lead strangers to make an incorrect assumption about the man. We not only get a rough idea of what Victor Henry looks like, but also a sense of the man himself. Looking at the prose, the first thing I noticed when analyzing Wook's descriptions is that he's not afraid to alternate between the passive and active voice. Refer to my video on the active voice linked below if you're unsure what I mean by that. To my mind, descriptions and introspection are the two main places where, as a narrative writer, you're given the liberty to use the passive voice, because describing static features or thoughts in dynamic or active ways often comes across as overdone, like you're trying a bit too hard to impress the reader. Instead, Wook overcomes the flaws inherent with the passive voice by providing insight into the character he's describing. Not only does he describe Victor's clothes, but mentions that they were clothes for a younger man. Not only does he describe the lines around his eyes, but suggests that they were this way, possibly from long years of peering out to sea. I also like Wook's choice of short sentence structures at both the beginning and end of this description. As far as cadence or rhythm goes, this technique works well to package descriptions within a narrative. This next example is perhaps technically classified as exposition, but since it's used to describe the character's personality, I thought I'd include it to show you how these elements of writing craft often overlap. She did what had to be done as a navy wife, but she was free, loud, and frequent in her complaints. She could crab for months on end in a place she disliked, such as Manila. Wherever she was, she tended to fret about the heat, or the cold, or the rain, or the dry spell, or servants, or taxi drivers, or shop clerks, or seamstresses, or hairdressers. To hear Rhoda Henry's daily chatter, her life passed in combat with an incompetent world in a malignant climate. A technique Wook uses often, on display here, is to elaborate on passive surface descriptions by providing more specificity. Here, Wook begins with the passive statement, she was free, loud, and frequent in her complaints, but is quick to elaborate with, wherever she was, she tended to fret about the heat, or the cold, or the rain, etc. And he uses the repetition of the word or to give the sentence a monotonous feel, which I think is well suited to this description. He then goes a step further and sums all of it up with the elegant, insightful sentence, to hear Rhoda Henry's daily chatter, her life passed in combat with an incompetent world in a malignant climate. 
If you want to ensure your description is memorable, summing it up in an elegant, concise way is an excellent literary technique. In an old gray sweater and slacks, his tanned, lean face glowing from the exercise, his hair tousled, a cigarette slanting from his thin mouth, he looked much like the lad who, on graduating from the academy, had vanished from their lives. Victor Henry envied Warren the deep sunburn which bespoke a destroyer bridge, tennis, green Oahu hills, and above all, duty at sea, thousands of miles from Constitution Avenue. Again, Wook begins by describing the character's physical appearance, in and of itself a surface description, before adding depth to it by mentioning that, from his father's perspective, he looked much like the lad who, on graduating from the academy, had vanished from their lives. This blends his physical appearance with a bit of useful exposition. Wook does this again when he joins together Victor's longing to be back out at sea with a description of his son's deep sunburn. The closer I inspect the writing of Herman Wook, the more I begin to notice how he's often conveying more than one piece of information at the same time, which, as I've said before, is the mark of a skilled writer. The following three short excerpts are examples of how Wook describes nuanced attributes and expressions. Byron, in the center with the defiant large mouth, the half-closed analytic eyes, the thick full hair, the somewhat sloping face peculiarly mingling softness and obstinate will, Byron owed his looks to neither parent. He was his strange self. Natalie was regarding him with a satiric look, as though she had already concluded that he was a fool, and Byron was not fool enough to miss that. A little smile curved Madeline's mouth, more ominous perhaps than a rebellious tantrum, a smile of indulgence. In all three examples, Wook begins with a surface description, then elaborates with some specific insight that captures the nuance of it. In the first, Byron's peculiar appearance is summed up elegantly with, he was his strange self. In the second, Natalie's expression is elaborated upon with the simile, as though she had already concluded that he was a fool. And in the last, Madeline's smile is elaborated on not once, but twice, writing first that it is more ominous perhaps than a rebellious tantrum, and then narrowing it down to a smile of indulgence. This demonstrates insight on the part of the writer, and offers the reader a peek beneath the surface layers of each character. Have you talked to Hitler, Commander Henry? What is he really like? said Mrs. Lacotour, a thin, faded woman with a placating smile and a sweet tone that suggested her social life consisted mainly of softening her husband's impact, or trying to. I absolutely loved this description. The character Mrs. Lacotour is introduced in a single line, and by the time I got to the period, I felt as if I knew her. I suspect that many people know, or know of, that couple where the husband is boisterous, outspoken, and liable to cause a scene, and the wife is always just trying to rein him in. To my mind, Wook described this type of woman with such elegance that she immediately became real to me. This description leans heavily on the author's insight into personality types, and can't be faked, so really pay attention to the people around you and see if you can figure out what traits would do well to define them, in a narrative sense. Lastly, with regards to character descriptions, I thought I'd toss in that of the Fuhrer himself, given that this historical fiction takes place during World War II. Hitler had a remarkable smile. His downcurved mouth was rigid and tense, his eyes sternly self-confident, but when he smiled this fanatic look vanished. The whole face brightened up, showing a strong hint of humor and a curious, almost boyish shyness. When he was particularly amused, he laughed and made an odd sudden move with his right knee. He lifted it and jerked it a little inward. This description begins with a punchy sentence, and is quickly followed by an elaboration, and it's another great example of how elaborating on a simple expression can provide insight into the character. Wook describes Hitler's smile as a transformation from fanatic to humorous, curious, and almost boyish, and this contrast gives a certain depth to him, character-wise. It gives the reader, who already knows him, the impression that Hitler is all too human, a man capable of unimaginable cruelty, but a man all the same. Or perhaps Wook is trying to convey that this dramatic shift in expression is deceit on Hitler's part, I really don't know. Either way, making the reader ask questions like this tends to intrigue them, so don't be afraid of ambiguity, but, you know, don't make everything ambiguous, either. In addition, this bit about Hitler's twitch is a good example of specificity. This unique trait is then associated with Hitler's amusement, which, in the future, would give Wook the option to convey Hitler's amusement, perhaps when he's trying to hide it, by simply showing this jerk of the knee. Now that you have a bit of insight into how Wook describes his characters, let's change gears and examine the writing techniques he uses to describe his settings. One technique in particular stands out, used here in Wook's description of a naval yard. If one ignores the flags and signs, in fact, the naval facilities of big powers were hard to tell apart. The low, black U-boats tied in clusters to the long piers or resting on blocks in dry docks, the smell of tar, hot metal, and seawater, 
The slow clank and screech of overhead cranes, the blaze of welding torches, the rattle of riveters, the flat or curved sections of steel painted with yellow or red primer swinging through the air, the gigantic open sheds, the mounds of piping, cables, timbers, and oil drums, the swarms of grease-blackened cheerful men in dirty coveralls, goggles, and hard hats, the half-finished hulls propped with timbers on rails slanting into dirty water. He might have been in Japan, France, Italy, or the United States. The technique I was referring to, as you may have guessed, is this listing structure, where numerous descriptions of the setting are simply stated in a continuous manner, separated by semicolons. Personally, I really like this technique because a single setup sentence can be used to prompt, and give context to, a landslide of description. And as the writer, you can describe to your heart's content until the picture you're trying to paint is realized. Wook also awakens three of the five senses in the reader. There are the visuals, of course, but he places a large emphasis on the sounds, using words like clank, screech, blaze, and rattle, which are well suited to immersing the reader in a loud industrial setting. He also evokes the sense of smell, referring to the scent of tar, hot metal, and seawater to further this immersion. The last thing I'll touch on in this example is Wook's focus. When you're writing a setting, you want to focus on whatever is unique about it. Here, it's the U-boats, piers, docks, cranes, steel, primer, gigantic open sheds, mounds of piping, cables, timbers, oil drums, swarms of grease-blackened cheerful men, half-finished hulls, and dirty water. Wook mentions only those things which define this place, none of the ordinary things one might find lying around. So remember to ask yourself, what feature of my setting really makes it what it is? and consider limiting your description to whatever they happen to be. Similarly, Wook describes Berlin in Nazi Germany by focusing almost exclusively on the swastika flags, as this is what stands out most about the setting. Outside the hotel, long vertical red banners of almost transparent cheesecloth with the black swastika in a white circle at their center were swaying all along the breezy street, alternated with gaudy Bulgarian flags. The way to the chancellery was lined with more flags, a river of fluttering red, interspersed with dozens of Nazi standards in the style of Roman legion emblems, long poles topped by stylized gilt eagles perching on wreathed swastikas, and underneath, in place of the Roman SPQR, the letters NSDAP. In order to highlight the listing structure that Wook's descriptions often have, I've collected the following two excerpts. Wounded people were piled and crowded helter-skelter along the marble floor awaiting help, mostly in rags, all dirty, green pale, groaning or crying or in a faint, men and women, Poles and Jews, blood smeared, unbandaged, with clothing ripped, with faces torn open, with arms and legs gashed, with an occasional red stump of limb blown away and terrible white bone showing. What a world! No sidewalks, no shops, no movie houses, no garages, no cars, no bicycles, no streetlights, no hydrants, no billboards, not a sound, not a sight to connect the town with the 20th century, except a string of telegraph poles stretching along the river. In both examples, a single setup sentence is followed by a list of descriptive details, and each uses a similar sort of repetition. In the former, the repetition occurs through the use of the word with, and in the latter, through the use of the words no and not. Personally, I like this style, as it builds a sort of momentum as you read it. As in the previous examples, each description has a central focus. In the former, this focuses on all the brutal ways the people are suffering, and in the latter, the description focuses not on what there is, but what there isn't, namely all the amenities of 20th century America. Though the usual church stood on the usual knoll, the villagers were almost all Jews. Medzis was a cluster of houses on crooked, narrow dirt or cobbled streets, some log, some plastered, a few brick, sloping down toward a flat green meadow in the winding river. About a mile beyond the town, a roofless great house in the style of a French chateau lay ruined on the riverbank. The noble family was extinct, the house was a casualty of the world war, but the village survived. Here, in a similar manner to his character descriptions, Wook implements the reliable technique of following a description of something that would be a bit bland on its own, that of the village, with a description of something very specific and thought-provoking, that of the ruined French chateau. When he mentions the house was a casualty of the World War, but the village survived, he provides an insight into the village and gives it character. Now, the reader will think of it as a tough little place, able to endure through great hardship. Behind her, in the big central offices of CBS News, the hubbub over the war news was still rising. 
Secretaries were rattling at typewriters or scampering with papers, messenger boys ran with coffee and sandwiches, knots of men in shirt sleeves gathered at the chattering teletypes, and everybody appeared to be either shouting or smoking or both. The technique I wanted to highlight here is that of elaboration, a technique used when describing both characters and setting. Wook begins with a setup sentence, using the word hubbub to describe the CBS news office, and then expands upon that, conveying this hustle and bustle through the hurried actions of the people working there. He uses words like rattling, scampering, ran, knots of men, chattering, and shouting, all of which support this atmosphere he's trying to build. When describing a scene with a particular tone or atmosphere, ask yourself, what specifically gives this place its feel? Don't just say, people were hurrying around. Paint a picture of what exactly they're doing. Remember, your story is only as real as you make it. Let me know in the comments if you found this analysis helpful, or if you need some clarification. And if you added a few new techniques to your writing repertoire, be sure to tune in next Saturday so you can add a few more. Thank you.